Ирина Грищенко from Anatomy Physiology 2, Spring 2019, Metropolitan State University. This is our TAs. I'm Alex. I'm Kyle. And what we're doing today, it's for you. In this beautiful Friday free day, we're doing this demo for laboratory exam one. Yeah, Yay. let's move on. Okay, cool. We're going to go ahead and show you the principle of the three sort of laboratory blood tests that we went over. The first thing we're going to talk about is the blood typing systems. Um, so as we discussed in class, there's type A, type B, type O antigens, and you can, uh, well, A, B, O, and then there's the anti-D, which is positive or negative. So when we talk about blood types, you might say I'm A positive or O negative. We know that O negative is the universal donor and that AB positive is the universal blood recipient. So we're going to go ahead and review really quickly how we in our laboratory, uh, in our lab class, determine blood type. So here I have two, um, two, two, uh, two different blood sources right here. I have an AB neg and an O pause. And I've already dropped out some drops of blood on the card. So if you follow along with me, we can see which of these two blood, uh, blood supplies it came from. So the principle of, of antigen antibody testing is like a lock and a key. So basically, you have antibodies in a in a sera, in an antisera, and they're just they're isolated. So for example, here we have anti A, here we have anti B, and over here we have anti D, which is the positive and negative. Um, and as we said, the principle is kind of a lock and key. So if you mix uh, a red blood cell that has B antigen with anti A, the lock and the key don't fit. But if you have that same uh, B antigen on a red blood cell and you mix it with the anti-B antibodies, it does. And as they all get tangled up and bond with each other, you see this phenomenon called agglutination, which is almost like a visual clotting, if you wanted to call it that, of the blood. It's not the same exactly as clotting, which is kind of like scab formation after a cut, but it's the same principle. So, okay, cool. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and quickly do the exam, or do the test. So we have our blood, so we'll go ahead and start off getting some of this anti-A, and do a drop. And then some anti-B. And then some of our anti-D for the positive and negative. And then what we simply do is we go ahead and we mix it up and we introduce those antigens and antibodies to each other. And you can see it's instantly starting to agglutinate right there with our anti-A. With our anti-B, give that a second, and then our anti-D. And as you give those antigens and antibodies a chance to interact with each other, that's when kind of the, the bonding happens. But you can see the same uh, agglutination happening there, and then our anti-D remains clear. So what this tells us is that this particular blood sample um, was positive for anti-A, so it's A, and then positive for B, although slightly weaker, and then negative for the D. So this is an AB negative blood, so corresponding to this sample right here. Moving on, um, one of the second tests we did in laboratory was the hematocrit test. The basic principle of this test is that we loaded a, a single uh, capillary tube with blood and we uh, centrifuged it to pack the red blood cells down. Through capillary action, we simply load it. This one's a little clotted and a little short. So what we do at this point is we would tap it down. We would seal off the bottom of it with this clay so that it doesn't leak out the bottom like you can see. And then we would take it and centrifuge it uh, in here with a balanced supply. So rather than, than showing the centrifugation pro centrifugation process, we've got some already spun samples right here. 
So the basic principle of the test is you start off by first aligning the bottom with the bottommost portion of the graph right there, and then you move the top, so this, the, the top margin, kind of the meniscus, you align that with the top part, so bottom and top, like that, and then you simply read where the red cells pack to. So in this case, it looks like they packed to about 40. You line that up just right, or maybe 38, 37, 38. So, and that would mean that we have a hematocrit of, of like we said, 37, or 30% 30 of the blood is made up of red blood cells. This top portion right here, this serum, that's the clear portion of blood that contains all the dissolved proteins and everything else. It should be noted that this portion, you can see the lines through it, it's yellow and it's clear, but that's the normal color and clarity for a healthy individual. So moving on from there, um, we have the Talquist test, which was another test that we did in laboratory. The basic principle of this test is you take some blood, heme has naturally red color, and as you let it kind of dry, you simply compare the color to the chart. Um, and so for example, over here, we'd say, well, that doesn't match at all. And over here, that's, um, and we let it dry, that's the other important feature. That would probably be too red. So maybe the, the, the correct, um, for this dry portion right here, the correct color maybe be somewhere in there and there. It's just a visual measurement of how red it is, which corresponds to how much hemoglobin is present in the supply. And the reason why all of this is important is that we know that hemoglobin, uh, the function of hemoglobin in red blood cells is to transport and carry oxygen. So if we had three patients here, we had a hematocrit of 47 between patients A and B and uh, patient C over here, you would say, if you were only looking at the red blood cells, well, who's in worse shape? Well, the person obviously that has fewer red blood cells, but then between these two individuals who have the same, no same number of red blood cells, you maybe dive down one further level and say, okay, hemoglobin is what carries oxygen. So we can see this individual, individual B, has twice the number, twice the amount of hemoglobin in their red cells as individual A. And so individual A, for example, there might be like malnutrition or something like that that caused uh, a smaller amount of hemoglobin to have been produced. And all these things are incredibly important because for the body to continue to function, transport of oxygen is one of the most important features. So now that we've talked about blood on a high level, about hematocrit and hemoglobin, here we're gonna talk real quick about the actual components of, of blood, the majority of which are red blood cells or erythrocytes, as we saw over there. Another structure in the blood is platelets. We're not gonna talk about those a ton, but those are important in the clotting process. Uh, and then the thing that we're gonna spend the majority of our time on are the white blood cells. Uh, from class, you should remember the mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. That's the order, uh, that's the, uh, the white blood cells in order of most abundant to least abundant. So neutrophils are the most, and then lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. And so one way, hopefully, that you can remember when you're looking at, a, at something through a microscope, what exactly you're looking at or, or at the photo, is, is a couple of these little tricks I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys right now. So of the five cells that you can see right in front of you, it's very obvious that the monocyte is the most, is the most massive of all of them. It's, it's double the size of pretty much any of the other cells. And so think massive monocytes. Uh, the lymphocyte, though, is about half the size of any of the other cells. So think, so think like a little, little lymphocyte, right? Um, and then for the other three, these particular granulocytes right here, and we call them granulocytes because they have granules inside of them, um, can be distinguished by the color of their cytoplasm right here. So if you notice in general, most of the time the nuclei stain roughly sort of the same color, that dark purple type color. But when you look, look at, the, uh, at, the, at the cytoplasm, uh, it becomes pretty obvious that it's different right here. So the granules in the cytoplasm here kind of stain that orange-red color. So the orange, it's, it's a stretch, I apologize for that. Orange eosinophils, kind of this blue-purple, blue basophils. And then this cytoplasm over here doesn't really take either of the colors, and that's a neutral neutrophils. And these different granules actually have a lot of importance and the structure have a lot of importance in, in what these particular cells do. So neutrophils, which we remember are the most abundant of all of the white blood cells, they're the first line attackers 
uh, when there's a bacterial infection. They are, they're the first ones to show up on the scene and immediately start uh, attacking the source of infection. That's why they're the most numerous. You can think about them like, like the police force versus down here we have the monocytes. You can think about them, they're, they're uh, less abundant. They're like special forces or the SWAT team. You can see that they're massive because they come in and like a big old garbage truck, they eat up entire bacteria and are responsible for really clearing out that infection and all the debris. So they're the first line attackers. These guys are the big old tanks that come in and, and really win the day. And then over here, the differences between the white blood cells, eosinophils with their orange granules are largely involved in attacking parasites and cancer cells. Uh, these basophils right here, they release histamine, which causes in inflammation. Inflammation, if you think of something getting red and swollen and inflamed, that's actually your body trying to divert more blood to the site of infection. It gets hot because all that blood is, is flowing there a lot more quickly because the more blood flows to the infection, the more white blood cells get to the infection. It's like, it's like turning uh, a side street into a big old highway. It lets so much more traffic through and lets more of these first responders get to the site of the infection. Last of all, we have the lymphocytes right here, which are more responsible for viral infection. They create a lot of antibodies, you know, B cells, or there's lots of different types of lymphocytes, but these tiny guys, they pump out the really tiny antibodies that, that uh, are responsible for, you know, for latching on to a bacteria or something else and are really a big part of the whole immune response. And antibodies is what gives you immunity and lets some of these other cells do their job a lot better. Um, so just as a recap, we have erythrocytes, which are the red blood cells. We have platelets, which are important in clotting. We've got neutrophils with their neutral cytoplasm that are the most abundant, never let monkeys eat bananas, the first line responders. We have our orange, orange, the O and eosinophils that are responsible for attacking things like parasites and cancer. You've got basophils, which uh, promote inflammation. Those granules release histamine, which causes like like in an allergic reaction, an antihistamine, we want to decrease swelling. It's that whole same thing going on there. We have lymphocytes that are responsible for a lot of the antibodies. And we have the monocytes that show up and engulf all this stuff and just kind of eat them down. So never let monkeys eat bananas um, from most abundant to the least abundant being basophils. We're going to give you a crash course on the structures and the, and the flow of the blood throughout the heart. So first off, the heart sits in a sac. It's called the pericardium. As the blood enters the heart, it's going to enter through the vena cava. Um, it can be very, very difficult on test day to identify structures from the outside alone simply by their site and position. So you really have to remember the flow. We know that blood returns to the vena cava and enters through the right atrium, the first chamber of the heart. So on test day, Orient, yourself, orient your heart appropriately with the ventricles um, pointing down and the left ventricle on the right hand side. So it's anatomical left. And another key might be the apex of the heart, which is this pointy part right here, should point off to your right or anatomical left that way. So when you orient the heart, the blood enters first through the atrium. The atrium from the outside are called the auricles and they look like these little flappy elephant ears right here. So if you can find the atrium, the oracle, find the vessel that enters into that oracle or that atrium. So we're oriented with the uh, right atrium, uh, the first chamber of the heart on my left hand side. It enters through the vena cava into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it passes through the tricuspid valve, tri before you buy is a way to remember it. So the tricuspid valve comes before the bicuspid valve. Through that valve into the right ventricle, right here. Structures of note inside both ventricles, you've got the chordae tendinae or the little heart strings. These guys right here, I'll show you here in the other ventricle. These right here. These are attached to muscles that are attached to the, these, these chordae tendinae attach papillary muscles to the valves and allow them to open and close. So from this right ventricle, uh, you, in this case it's tricky, you have to remember that this is a 3D structure and it passes not back through the atrium but up here on top. It passes out through the right ventricle through the pulmonary artery away from the heart 
but it's gonna pass away from the heart out to the lungs, come back, and it's gonna return through the pulmonary valve entering the left atrium. And once again, if you don't know where the atrium is, remember to orient yourself appropriately and then find the oracle or ear looking thing. That is the first atrium from the outside. So it returns, in this case, the uh, left, or the, the left uh, pulmonary, the pulmonary artery is kind of hidden underneath um, these vessels right here. So it returns um, right here. It returns through the right atrium, that oracle on the, or sorry, the left atrium, that oracle on the right hand side. And as we open up the heart, you can see that it's coming back in right there through the atrium. It passes through the bicuspid valve, which has its own chordae tendine and a papillary muscle right there endocardium on the inside. And then as the, as the left ventricle, or the more muscular one, contracts to send the blood supply out through the body, it leaves through this uh, aortic semilunar valve right here, um, out through the, uh, the arch of the aorta, which is kind of these two structures right here. So at this point in time, the only other thing left to discuss is the two, is kind of the internal structure of the heart right here. So this is the septum or the, uh, the interventricular septum, and the actual muscle, or the actual tissue that comprises the heart all through here is called the myocardium. So at this point in time, we've traced the entire flow of the blood from the vena cava to the right atrium, to the right ventricle, out through the tri, the, and the tricuspid valve that separates the two of them, out through the pulmonary artery to the lungs, the return supply back to the left atrium, into, the, and the oracle, as it can be seen from outside, the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then out through the aorta. Hey, let's go over this mink, the endocrine system here. So we have a, ma a male and a female mink, and we're just gonna go down our list. We're gonna start with a thyroid. So in order to find the thyroid, you're going to find the larynx, which is easy to find because it's this ribbed um, tube along the throat. And the thyroid are these two nodules along the larynx. I believe that that might be one here, but Moving down the line, we're gonna to go to the thymus. And the thymus is this flap covering the heart. So we're gonna go down and go through all of this muck. It should be underneath near the kidney. And it can be identified by the granules in through here. The biggest marker for your adrenal is your kidney, the bean shape. Now, in humans, the adrenal gland is directly on top of the kidney. So there's our kidney. Let's pull up and in. And there is an adrenal gland up in here. I can feel it, but I can't get the camera to show you. But if you find the kidney and go up and towards the center, you should be able to feel two hard nodules, and that's your adrenal gland. And you're gonna look for the horns. So this is broken, but the horns to the ovary were right here and would attach like that. But they've broken. Pretty easy to identify. We're going to go back over it, the thyroid gland. Two nodules on either side of the larynx. <clears throat> over on the mink, you'll find them here and here. Moving down to the, thy the thymus, just above the heart, <clears throat> this female mink has a good specimen right here. Now we're going to the pancreas. So over here, pancreas. 
So we lift this up and flip it over, and we have our pancreas right here. And then lastly, we go to our next, the adrenals, which would be right here. Find our kidney and go just up and in, and they would be right here. And moving on, yes, this is the adrenal gland right here. And in these specimens, they're missing. But again, kidney and just above. Um, next up, the ovaries, which are broken, but there's one right here. Where did it go? Right here. And then the testes right here. All right. Next, we'll go into the sheep's brain. Um, and there are only three things that we need to identify for this lab exam here. So we'll start with the full brain. And we're gonna start with the pineal gland. So this is the cerebellum. That's gonna be your landmark. If you pull down the cerebellum and separate the lobes, you'll see this little nodule right here. Thank you. And that is your pineal gland. Flipping the brain over, we're gonna use a landmark the optic chiasm which is right here and just below that you would see the pituitary gland and this one is broken but there is a little bit a little piece of it remaining so your pituitary gland is just this tiny little nodule that hangs off there let's go into the half sheep's brain and see it from a different angle so <clears throat> this is your hypothalamus and that may or may not be on the lab exam um, but I use this point as a marker to find my pituitary because if you go just below, you'll see that the optic chiasm is here and your pituitary is here. And then moving towards the cere cerebellum as your landmark here, your pineal gland is directly inside. So the three things that may be on the test, pineal gland, pituitary, and hypothalamus. Okay, so here we have a quick recap of some of the endocrine cells, uh, some of the major glands involved in the endocrine system. I'd like to try and present this in a way that uh, everyone feels pretty comfortable uh, with the structure and that everyone agrees that one structure is very different from another structure. So let's start off with perhaps the most obvious of these, of these six uh, these six slides right here, of these six tissue types. So we'll start off with the thyroid gland. Um, the thyroid gland, as you can tell, is a very, it's almost like a, it's almost like looking down on a lake from up above. So, so almost like, like it's, like it's, because it's empty, it's void on the inside. So thyroid, I don't know if that helps, void, void thyroid uh, might help. But you definitely see these, these, uh, these, almost these vesicles right here that are just filled um, with this colloid that it produces. So the thyroid gland is this circular structure. It's very different from, for example, the pituitary uh, and the parathyroid and the adrenal. Um, it might be somewhat similar. You could think about it um, somewhat simpler, sim similar to the pancreatic islet cell down here, down in the pancreas, which is what produces adrenaline, or not adrenaline, insulin. Um, this also has a very circular structure, but whereas the thyroid is void on the inside and is empty, this one is full. This one is full um, of of, of cells. Uh, so it's like an island. The islet part helps you out. It's like an island of cells and, uh, you know, surrounded by a bunch of other cells or, uh, you know, almost like a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of, if you're looking down on a swimming pool, it's full of, you know, people floating around, um, I don't know, cretins or I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a good way to remember that one. But, uh, but the pancreatic islet cell is, uh, is like a, will be a circle filled with cells, whereas the thyroid will be a circle empty. Okay. So then moving over to the uh, probably the next uh, most easy to identify structure, that will be the adrenal gland. Uh, it's a very layered gland that you can see it has, it has different zones to it that, that are responsible for secreting and doing different things. Um, but it has a, a layered structure that you don't see in the other areas, whereas this is the pancreatic islet cell is very round and the thyroid is round. This is layered horizontally. So if you have like a layered birthday cake type thing, 
it's the adrenal glands because one layer add adds on top of the other. So the adrenal gland has layers that add one on top of each other. Whereas the pancreatic islet cell is like an island uh, full of cretins, <laughs> I don't know, uh, where you can see from above, and the thyroid is a void circle. Okay, so switching over to the mink manual, you can see the same uh, sort of follicle structure with a colloid on the inside of the thyroid, the void thyroid right there. We have this ring of cells surrounding a big, almost like a lake from above, and you see how kind of tight they are right up next to each other, um, almost like a, like a bunch of balloons shoved up, you know, close uh, to each other. Uh, down here is, is a cross-section of the thymus, uh, not something you particularly uh, need to know at this point. Uh, over here, we return to the pancreas, and you see once again, it's like uh, it's like that lake uh, got filled in, you know. Except rather than you know, this is almost like you know a little island in a sea of very dense cells, you know, with those, with those all, uh, with that islet, uh, pancreatic islet right there, the, also known as the islet of Langerhans. Um, this is a, a slightly zoomed out view of the adrenal gland. So remember before how we talked about how a horizontal layered structure, you still see that here. There's a very distinct uh, difference between you know, each, of the, each of the layers, but you are quite zoomed out. But it still has that horizontal structure, whereas the pancreatic cell, uh, pancreatic tissue is very circular, and, and likewise the thyroid was very circular. Um, here we have uh, an example of ovarian tissue. Uh, it also has a, maybe a, a circular structure, you might say, but it almost looks more like almost looks more like a carbonation bubbles in a, in, in a soda. Where if you remember the thyroid, they were kind of right up close to each other. These are more spread apart, various sizes. There is some clearing, some some in the center there, but the the the, um, the thyroid was completely empty with that colloid, whereas this contains uh, at the center a developing ovum. Um, and then down here, the uh, the testicular tissue. Once again, it kind of has that circular structure going on, and they're and they're a little bit pressed up on each other, perhaps. Uh, but they, um, but I think you would agree, this has cells on the inside, but looks very very different from the pancreatic tissue with the islet of Langerhans, because whereas there, you know, the pancreatic tissue had cells on the inside, it was very dense with cells around it. Um, this is is in some ways the opposite. There are cells on the inside. And, uh, and, and nothing, you know, very a lot less on the outside. Um, and then the ovarian tissue, these various developing follicles, once again, sort of more spread out, quite different from the, uh, from the thyroid uh, because there's still stuff kind of contained inside. So I hope that helps, um, and uh, good luck on the exam, everybody.